companies like us that are design build, we are your architect. We are your designer, and then we are your builder, and then we manage it all for you. From the beginning when you started work till now, you've had over like 150 roles. A foundation's a foundation's a foundation. How you choose to do it can be the best quality cut and clarity, or maybe lower, but they're both a diamond. All right, well, welcome to the Beyond Wealth podcast, Kevin Miso. Did I do it right? Yeah, Kevin yeah. Miso. That's right, like <laughs> Miss America with an O. <laughs> um, thanks for coming on. You are the CEO. You and your wife uh, run Riverbrook Construction, do a ton of stuff in the home one, Mountain Brook, a lot of custom homes. Um, you know, you've been doing that for a while. Also do some furniture and stuff, but... So grateful that you would come on. Thank you. Talk about building houses. Talk about building businesses. Talk about building people. Um, yeah, thank you for being here, man. You're welcome. Excited to be here. My wife and I started our company about eight years ago. We are Riverbrook Design and Construction. We do everything from interior design, architecture, and then the full construction. Man, and I love that. That's that's great. So talk to me. Let's start. Let's start at the beginning. You know, offline we're we're kind of. Talking about just job transition stuff, you said that you just looked back at your from the beginning when you started to work, when you're probably your dad or mom put you to work <laughs> in the yard till now, you've had over like 150 roles and do- exactly. jobs and different things. Talk about that journey and then kind of how you landed uh, at Riverbrook and kind of building that. Wow. We, we don't, I don't want to give the whole list of jobs. <laughs> He's like, started at. Yeah, kind of started starting 15. I mean, I don't know if they still do that today. You used to have to have a worker's permit. Yeah. So you're talking about at your high school going into counselor's office and getting what they just a one page worker's permit to work at Sneaky Pete's off Deerfoot Parkway in Clay when it first landed uh, to today, you know, at 41 years old, I think from that period of time on and off had had that many different occupations. If it was my own lawn service or a brick company or a tree service or uh, some sort of slow entry level medical position at a hospital to uh, washing cars at a local dealership to an old change service Man. into construction. I mean, marketing, this is talking about positions on and off at while you were in college, I was at Jeff State, and I worked on and off a couple of jobs around that schedule in yeah. South Alabama. Um, but then has led me to learn something from each position to bring it into my own company today. So when we're on these journeys, I think a lot of times there are like key things that are just imprinted on our brains of like, I've learned this lesson and I will always, you know, it's, it's almost those things you tell your kids just like, you know, this is the way we should operate. This is an ethos now. What are some of the things you've carried through all those things that you've picked up that you're just like, this is part of my OS, basically? That's a good question. Um, you know, be kind, rewind. You know, they used to have blockbusters and video expresses. <laughs> you used to have to go buy VHS. And <laughs> now you would, we're dating they, ourselves. They would I ask those you, they'd ask you to slide it in because they had employees that slide them in, push it uh, down, yeah. and they would zip a rewind before they cased it. Yeah. You know, it was just, just asking you to do kindness. You know, I think it's one of those on every job, just, you know, kind of that whole pay it forward thing. Just, you know, just treat someone how you want to be treated, no matter what position you're in. Uh, because I've been in the positions uh, where there's lowest level in, in entry level. And today, you know, being a manager, I think of, of you know, nine people with, in our company is just understanding, respecting, and just being kind in all, in all you know, positions and also the subs you work with i mean i mean there's so beyond that nine there's a ton of vendors right. that you work with that's right and, yeah and i i agree too like it, i have been you know i started talking about 14 you know and i was slinging burritos that's right and now you know growing this place where i do manage some people or talk with vendors and all that and it's like the way you don't treat anyone better or worse you treat everybody the same. That's right. You know, and people have value. And I think that ethos is is really good. So be kind. Anything else? Uh, you know, it's all a service. It's all service oriented. Regardless of what position you're in, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be a service. You're working with the public. So it's taking that transition into anywhere. If you own your own company or you have that W-2 every day, it's just service oriented. So it's just meeting people where they are. Yeah. It's a people business, 
And when you really break down, you know, I would say 90% of business is people business. Like at the end of the day, it all boils down to helping people um, as a client, helping people as, you know, uh, employees, like right. all those different things. So, all right. So you've taken your journey. You've tried a bunch of different things. And then eight years ago, you landed on Let's Do Construction Company. That's right. What was that conversation like with your wife of like, hey, I think we should build this? Was was that a little bit of convincing? Was it like you guys were already fully on board with doing like some flips and it was like a natural progression or was it this big leap for y'all? Great question. She graduated from Auburn in an engineering degree called building science. So she was already in commercial construction. And her whole vision for going into that building science program was to always do residential home building. She loved design. She loves construction. And I was an Alabama grad, Roll Tide, and I was a PR marketing guy. And she, after we got married, said, I'd love to try and start this residential construction company. While she was still at Robbins and Morton, yeah. we started a residential construction company, and I was managing it. And we started out with flip houses. She would design those projects in her free time and I would be on site managing the construction, managing our subs while she was at Robinson Morton. Uh, and then we got to a point a couple of years in where she was able to step away from what we called her big girl job because <laughs> she was carrying, she's the breadwinner. Yeah. You know, I, you know, we were, we were thrilled about it, but we were, we were putting all of our eggs on ourselves. Yeah. You know, we were putting a hundred percent of the risk of it, it making or breaking on ourselves right. when she stepped out. But the second we had enough projects from doing flips to now mm -hmm. uh, to say, all right, we can manage this. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we brought her on board and uh, still one of our one of our biggest clients today. We work with Robbins and Morton. Uh, we love them. They're family. Uh, we do a lot of their offices all over the country with furnishings. So we do full furnishings also. Gotcha. And when they launch it in San Antonio or in uh, Tampa, Florida, we're kind of there to help them when they finish you know, furnish their offices. Wow, that's awesome. So how you leave one company is how you're going to enter the next. She entered, she left Robbins and Morton uh, with a stellar resume, yeah. great yeah, relationships, yeah, yeah. and entered Riverbrook. And, um, uh, that's you know, huge. today we still work with them because of how she exited that. So another another lesson learned is always exit a company, how you enter your next and make it positive. Yeah, 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 because that's an opportunity. You know, like I, I know when I did my transition into full-time real estate, I did probably a third of my income freelance with the companies that I left or relationships I left still. So that helped float that transition. That's right. You know, yeah. um, and it was a different field. So, you know, I still, I don't do as much with those companies. But um, so y'all decided to make the leap and transition in a river book. Did y'all start with mostly flips and then get into building, building like from the ground up or what compromises like how that transition go um, from flipping to now like fully custom homes? Great question. We... We started out in Mountain Brook, kind of buying our first kind of 250 lower end in that area project. Yeah. Now you couldn't find that. No, you can't. Yeah, I was man, like, <laughs> tear downs like, today are like half a million. Where'd you find yeah. 250? Yeah. Tell yeah. me. Like <laughs> backside of Mountain Brook, off of Brookwood Road, South Brookwood, yeah, yeah, backed yeah. up to kind of Vestavia. We bought it, remodeled it. And at that time, they were kind of fully finished selling in the six. 50s. Right. Um, you know, and then we found one in Homewood that kind of met that model. Then was second in Homewood that met that model. And then we found another in Mountain Brook. And then as you finish a product, and then we get that product sort of online, we were listing with a real estate agent at the time. I didn't have my license. Um, you know, people come in and see who did the house. At some point, we still had our sign up in the yard. Oh, Riverbrook did it. They may not have bought it, but a family that walked through Right. saw it, called us to do the remodel, and now we picked up a project in Homewood while we bought another uh, flip project in Homewood, both just so ironically we're on the same street. So we had a couple signs up on a high-profile road and then ended up getting a third call, started the third project in Homewood, not on the same street but down the road. And that's how anything starts is we just yeah. put all of our eggs in ourselves. We bought a house. We had a house going. We did the construction on it and then got a call to pick up another project. So, you know, it was just continuing to invest in ourselves until years later, looking back, 
we don't have a single project. We have 26 jobs right now, and we don't do flip houses anymore. Mm -hmm. We don't have our own specs. We just work for clients. Right. So every house you see we're building or we're remodeling is someone else's. But it took us going out, implementing our design and construction for others to see what you're capable of before they have faith in you and give you a chance to do their own home. Man, I love what you said about betting on yourselves. You know, like at the end of the day, like the investment into yourself, the investment into what you believe in, what you're passionate about is going to lead to, you know, eventual success. I'm sure there was a couple of years or a couple months there where you're like, I don't know if this is going to work. <laughs> like, you know, you only have one project and you're like, oh, man. But like you said, it built the quality, the design, all those things built, built um, on you know, to the next thing, to the next That's thing. That's right. So. And then you can always build off of that. I remember we were at our first house that we got married in and had our first child in in Homewood. And there was a guy that broke down in front of our house on Shades Creek. Okay. He was about a, he was about a $300,000 Corvette. He just bought it from Barrett Jackson Auction. It was just kind of joyriding since it just hit Birmingham. And I got down there with a gas can. And I'm like, hey, just run out of gas. Come to find out it was kind of having some issues. Uh, but he's one of my mentors today. He was a number seven in Russell Lands. So another thing I've learned uh, is grab a good mentor. Mm -hmm. Always have mentors in your life. And uh, I still sit down with him today. I was texting him yesterday. But one thing I've learned from him is when you're betting on yourself to circle back, um, and you start whatever venture that is, there's always other things that complement that venture mm. that you may could write down, I can't do now, but maybe later, that you could start to complement it. And that's how we landed in interiors, is when we would finish a project, we would it needed to be furnished. A lot of people walk into an empty house and can't see it. Well, you can hire a stager, or you now we can furnish it. Uh, but it's just kind of bringing the process together so people can walk in and visualize it all. That's where my sofa or kitchen table would be. Um, so we started that interiors to complement the construction and the design, and that led to you know us starting other businesses. But I would say when you're betting on yourself. Don't limit yourself. Start out, you know, with with what your heart's desire is, but then there's a lot of opportunity for you to grow. What talk me through it because I love that, and I've never heard it said that way. Of like, you may it may not be the time to start that business because you just started this other thing, right? And it's like some, you know, I, I'm a big believer in don't build, you know, uh, a bridge, a small bridge to twenty islands because you'll never get to any of them. You know, sometimes you really have to focus and say, we're going to build, you know, the bridge to this island. But in the midst of that journey, you guys found other opportunities, but you probably didn't pull the trigger like the next day. That's right. You said, let's put this on the shelf. Let's see if we keep on these requests keep coming in. And if we get 10 of these or 15 of these, we'll go ahead and start branching out. What is that filter that y'all use to say, okay, it's time to start interiors? That's a good question. You know, timing's everything. We, yeah. we, we, it, it's evident that we are people of faith. We, you know, we love Jesus around our office. Our, our company started Riverbrook with a scripture, John seven thirty eight, out of his mouth full of rivers of living water. Our marker is sort of the Holy Spirit and guidance. And, and where I can go with that is when I was at Jeff State, they offered a real estate course. I took the real estate course, I passed it, <laughs> but then you still have to sit for the state test. Yeah, yeah. Well, I sat for the state test and failed it miserably. Took it again, <laughs> failed it again. You know, at Jeff State, you're in a different season. I was younger in a different season. Well, it wasn't until a decade later I actually sat down, took my real estate license, and passed it. So that's a great lesson to the seasons. I, I sat down and took a real estate. Timing was off, yeah. and then I take it a year later – timing is on, well, we ended up starting our own brokerage, Riverbrook Realty, uh, and, and you know, grew that arm until we just merged with Keller Williams Homewood now, uh, and we're investor partners there, yeah. but, but it, was, it was timing, to answer your question. When I was at Jeff State, the timing wasn't exactly right, but years later, the timing was perfect and passed the course on the first time yeah. and then moved on to kind of grow our real estate division. That's awesome. Is there an element of, because um, I think about the failure of not passing the test. And even though, like, I say the word failure on purpose because I don't consider it a failure, but the failure would have been to not try again or to take that as like, well, 
I guess I'm not supposed to be in real estate. Yeah. Could you imagine if you had told yourself that lie, where you would be at now? You can't. You can't. You, you got to stay positive. It's, it's the age-old <laughs> comment that I'm about to probably butcher. Thomas Edison created the light bulb a thousand times you yeah. know, before he created it the one time, and it was the filament he actually created correctly. Right. And they asked him, you know, why did you keep going or what did you learn? And he said, I learned how not to make a light bulb yeah. 999 <laughs> times. You know, so it's just taking something positive out of that, not addressing the negative. Oh, as I failed to create the light bulb 999 yeah. times. He says, I learned how not to. So I think right. taking that positive outlook, you know, and, and using that to kind of grow and create. Man, I love that. So you've basically been on this journey of, of River Brook. Could you f- figure out like a defining moment when you guys really kicked it into high gear, interiors going, you know, your full on custom builds, like, you know, kind of when you went into you know, the second mode, or was it a slow progression? Because I think sometimes companies, when I've, when I've heard it said, I'm not where you're at, but there's, there's a gap of like, it's either really, it's, it's, it's good to stay small and pretty, pretty singular yeah. and do, do just a few jobs and keep your overhead low, or you got to be really big because the overhead gets climbs and the and the gap in between those two is very difficult yeah. to be in. And so what did that look like now that y'all are on the larger side doing a lot of jobs, all those kinds of projects, but you started with one. Right. Was that a slow progression and in the middle was just really tough or did you did you make some decisive decisions that's like, hey, we're at the brink of staying small, we're going to boom, 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 and we're going to get big really quickly? How did that, that work? That's a good question. I think early on, we had systems and processes that we didn't know were systems and processes. <laughs> we were good. Yeah. And we didn't know yeah. we were good. We, we operated out of our basement for the first couple of years because obviously Lee had her big girl job. Yeah. I started kind of working on our flip houses and we had hired our first employee and we did what we call a daily stand up. We have a we have a whiteboard and we're writing our projects on the whiteboard. We're writing our responsibilities on the whiteboard. Um, and it was in our, our garage and our, our one guy would come to the garage, me him, and Lee would early morning meet. And then we were off. We would have, we had Wesley there, which is our baby, our newborn baby. And he was in his little rocker. And we always said, Wesley, he didn't stand. He never stand up. You know, we all stood up and he was laying down on the job. But, uh, that was one of the processes we carried on. I think the biggest transition to answer your question for us and for anybody is when do I get out of my house and get into an office space, and where is that office space? I think when you when you bet, when you're betting on yourself to take on overhead now, it's easy yeah. to take on overhead if you're flipping your own lights and it's your mortgage and you work to feed uh, yourself. But now I've got that facility, and now I'm trying to take on another, and that yeah. has lights and yeah. printers and telephones and a landlord on a lease. You know, when, once you step out and you take that on, I think that's when you head to the next level. But it's stepping out and taking that risk before you realize it because we stepped out we were on highway 31 great location huge traffic reports through our riverbrook sign up we're there for you know a few months and then got approached by a local publication because they just so happened to be across the street and they said hey we've, we've never heard of you guys who are you would y'all want to work with us on the inspiration house and we're like, are you kidding? We just left our living room. <laughs> sure we would. Sounds great. Yeah, brand builder. Uh, you know, and they're great today. I was over at their office and, and just awesome, awesome guys. Um, but we jumped into our new construction project. So we were remodeling, 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 working out of our house, <clears throat> jump out there, get on a, you know, a high traffic report, and, you know, road. And it wasn't those traffic reports that spotted us. It was yeah. we were across the street from the right place. Then that was just God's timing. You know, there's just some things just have to line up. You can work hard, work hard, work hard. Uh, there's but, a little luck involved. Yeah, 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 yeah. Come on. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Ended up coming in, kind of meeting with them. Hey, have you ever doing a construction project? No, we haven't, but we remodel. New construction is a little smoother than remodels. Remodels, foundations have settled. Footings are cracked. Houses shift. So to come in and try to make something square, plumb, and level, three keys in construction, <laughs> is it harder than building yeah. new. 
Uh, yeah, so, yeah, so yeah. you got to have the right team uh, to make that happen. But anyway, built our new house. It was an inspiration house. Uh, raised a lot of money for a nonprofit. We selected all ticket sales, went to them, were able to grant a bunch of wishes for some kids, which was phenomenal. And uh, that put us for marketing in the new build category. Yeah. So now today we've torn down, you know, three houses just in the last kind of 12 months and we're building in Homewood now all of our new construction projects. Um, maybe due to that, but you know, it was get, gave us now sort of a trophy sitting on a piece of dirt that said, and that was a Riverbrook house. We bought it. You know, I feel like every time we've taken risk, mm -hmm. God has blessed it. Yeah. It's grown. It's multiplied. When we've done something else, we've seen it hasn't grown as much. We bought another flip house uh, in Mountain Brook that ended up hitting the front cover of, of Southern Living recently. Um, it has millions of views on Instagram. It was a property we bought as a flip house. Yeah. So when we look back to, we can see a track on our own projects where we've invested and it's always grown more even though we've done gorgeous clients' houses and they've been featured in Architectural Digest and Lux and, and all the other nicer projects, it's unknowingly the projects we've done have always grown. So take that risk, step out, yeah. whatever you're wanting to do, start a restaurant, start a painting company, start an accounting firm, take that risk in yourself uh, as long as you're hardworking and it'll pay off. Uh, so that location got us out of our home we, we were noticed, and I think that was sort of our unknowing maybe acknowledgement of, okay, these guys did a, a inspiration house. It was open to the public. The public is now able to come in and see you built that inspiration house. So it sort of put us on that radar of yeah. Riverbrook, you know, yeah. uh, where if we had stayed in the living room, would have never been noticed and maybe not hit that inspiration house. Uh, so I think stepping out and getting out of your your um, spot that you're in that maybe feels stagnant mm. and, uh, and and take that risk and get an office. And, and like you said, it's it's down to seasons, right? You know, if if you had said, "Hey, we got big dreams and we're going to pull the trigger on a space um, right off the rip," I think the overhead would have eaten you up. Easy. I think you wouldn't have had the systems in place. And so you chose to stay small for a time to build a good base, and then and then you took the second leap. And I think, you know, a lot in this world and just with instant gratification, all the things, like people look at you now and say, man, Riverbrook is crushing it, you know, and they don't hear all the backstory. They don't know all the, the hard times, the risks that were involved, the, hey, we're rolling the dice and we're betting on ourselves, but we don't know if this personal flips gonna pan out that's right and i think that's the entrepreneur journey that we all we all take and it's just so good like to hear it from your perspective of like you guys didn't build this overnight like it's been eight years but even before that you were building a skill set that helped you you know both y'all and so um it's just ma massive so i want to talk a little bit about kind of venturing into new builds because, you know, we've talked about a little bit about how you built Riverbrook and all those kind of things. But, you know, I've never had someone on the podcast yet who does like, con you know, foundation up construction at this okay. point. Um, well, I guess Mark Mark does, but he's yeah. a little more commercial. Yeah, he, Mark Hancock. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but all that to say is let's talk about that process. So from just kind of beginning to end, 30,000 foot view – if I am listening to this podcast and I'm like, you know, I've always think, thought about tearing my house down and building it the way I wanted it to be built, where do I start? That's a great question. What's that 30,000-foot view conversation you have with a client to say, hey, here's the steps. This is how we get to your dream home. That's a good question. So obviously uh, you got to have a good team. There's, there's two thought processes in that. Uh, you've got – find an architect, find a builder, find a designer. Mm -hmm. And and that's your team. And then you as the homeowner manage all three of those. Right. They're step one. Uh, and then through that, your builder will kind of help you with dirt work. He'll help you with pre-construction phase right. to get that ready. And then there's, there's a companies like us that are design build. We are your architect. 
we are your designer, and then we are your builder, and then we manage it all for you. It's all in one all solution. All in one. So it's four companies. They've got they've got now companies that actually you hire to manage your architect, your builder, and your designer, so uh, that you're not managing all three. You can now hire a consulting firm that manages them for you. So we're sort of the four in one. When you come into our office, we manage all of that. So that process to answer your question is either you either call one to help get a referral for the other two or right. three in some cases, or you call us and then we manage that full process for you. I, I would imagine that with you guys being the four in one solution, the the all the end all be all. There's a couple factors that I think of, and you can speak to it, but number one would be from a cost standpoint, you all may be a touch higher than if you were to piecemeal it out, but probably not as much as you think because you can bring everything in-house, you know where you can push and pull on budgets. Yeah, yeah good question. So managing it yourself um, is, is great, but one error with electrical, mechanical, and plumbing could be the, the the number that costs you that hiring a company like Riverbrook would have covered. Right. So yeah, it may be seven thousand or ten thousand dollars more, but you can easily have an error that at in the in the end of the day was caused because it wasn't managed properly that right. hiring Riverbrook in the first place would have covered. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, the second thing I think of is um, continuity. So when you have an architect, and a lot of people don't know, architects and designers are different. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they think they're all the same. Yeah. And they're not. And so when you have in-house two people who are in different departments but honestly should be working so hand-in-hand, hand, there's probably a continuity in your product that doesn't come when it's, I'm hiring this separate designer and this separate architect. Right. And not that they that can't work, and I'm not saying, you know, that's the end of the world, but I would think that your product has a continuity because of that relationship. Yeah, is yeah. You, but the architect and the designer are on the same page. Well, well we do. We're working for a pro, on a project right now with Hank Long, and it's, it's Hank is the architect. We got a, another designer in Mountain Brook, and we're the builders. Uh -huh. So we do the bid build process. Yeah. Um, you know, so, and, and, it, and it's great, uh, but there is systems in place that even they have that that are cultivated that the homeowner is managing for us to work through. We just finished a project uh, on Lake Martin that was a Bobby McAlpin was the architect, and we were the designer and and did the remodel on that project. So we do them. We we do yeah. work in that in that process. But there's multiple people for the homeowner to manage at that point right. versus the four in one model that yeah. we believe is is the future. And some of those communications you gotta make sure there's always those extra communications, that extra line and it's just extra work. Right. Which That's is, right. you know, maybe something that a homeowner wants to do. Um, but some don't, right. you know, and and so that's awesome that you built that four in one um, solution. You know, in that in that kind of thing, let's talk about so you obviously got a demo. So let's talk about just those steps. Demos, I, I'm assuming you, you create your plans, you get your specs, you get the budget, all that kind of pre-construction going. Right. Then you start demoing the house. That's right. And then you have to re-basically remove the dirt to fit your new configuration. That's exactly, yes. Okay. So in, the, in those steps, you've obviously got your civil plan with the civil engineer. you got your architectural plan with your architect. You've got... At that point, design phase could be on hold, yeah. but um, TBD, you know, yeah. to be determined, you're working on it. Um, you want to go ahead and at that point have everything scheduled. You, you need to know that when you tear down, if he's not your footing and concrete guy, you need to have your footing and concrete guy scheduled right behind him. Right. Uh, so in that process, you tear down. Most of the time, your guy that's tearing it down is your dirt guy. So okay. he's grading. You've got your civil plan. You've got what they call cut and fill stakes that you've marked the dirt on. Over here, you need to build this up a little bit. Over here, you need to cut it down a little bit. That helps divert water. Right. That helps allow the grade changing when you step out of your house, the difference in 100 steps and one step, right. depending on the lot, because <laughs> yeah. every lot's different. And then water diversion. Hey, yeah. we need to be wash, rock washing and, and diverting water away from the structure. Uh, one of the biggest things when I take clients out to look at homes, you know, that are pre-existing, we're not doing new construction at this point, you know, 
I always say the the biggest thing, and Mark actually taught me this. He said, how does the water get on your property and how does it get off? That's good. And so I like lots that aren't too uh, – I don't like flat, flat lots, like like perfectly flat because the water will just sit. I like lots that just have a little bit of a pitch so that we know that even even if it's there's water in the you know going in the crawl space it's also exiting the crawl space you know because right. there's just no way Birmingham gets water <laughs> like, there's no way around it it's wet here you know we get huge rains we get heavy rains that's right and so um, but then you don't want too much of a grave could grade because then that's just hitting all of that water that's hitting the ground and soaking into the, you know is hitting that basement and just I've seen so many cracked basements because of they're just dug way too deep under underground yeah, on, a, I, on a hill. I, I compare the the foundation work to floodplains. Yeah, it's yeah. not are you in a floodplain? It's what floodplain are you in? <laughs> yeah. You could be on top of a mountain and it's a hundred year. You know? Yeah, yeah. The same with foundations. It's not do I have foundational issues? It's what foundational issues do you have? Because uh, a lot of older remodels have foundation issues. It's yeah. a hydrostatic pressure. It's water. It's dirt. It's settling. It's racking. There's something, and that's part of our team too. Obviously, in that civil plan, if you're remodeling, there's that there's that structural. Yeah. Uh, if you're if you're in that remodel, but we were talking new construction, so you got to have that civil plan. Yeah. Um, but but then back to what you were saying, it's just scheduling. It's the second you demo, the second you get those old footings up, you do that dirt work. Second that dirt work's complete to divert that water, you go straight into digging footings. And yeah. Then when those footings are done, you got to have your concrete guys lined up to throw in your rebar you get your inspections off before you pour your concrete yeah and it's going from concrete and then it's just having your framers right behind your concrete guys or your masons if you're going to have a basement so if, if you're just pouring a slab you can go straight to framers right if you got to have a crawl space or a basement you're now pouring walls or you're you're blocking walls so yeah, there's, yeah, yeah there's a lot of options depending on your budgets again yeah. Um, you talk, know. talk me through uh, the difference of pouring a wall versus uh, using center block okay. b- block walls. Why, why would you choose one or the other? One's more expensive. That's what's exactly. A, what, yeah. What's the solutions there? Okay, so uh, you, you've poured your concrete. There's no way for your footings, no way to avoid that. Right. That's your foundation, most important thing. Um, second would be, do I have money to bring in the laborers to put in a bunch of form boards? So all these form boards are like Legos. You have locks and keys in each panel, and they're stacking all these panels depending on how high up you are. Then in some cases, you're bringing in a pump truck. Guys yeah. won't deal with a line truck. So they're they're bringing in a boom. Booms cost additional money. Right, right. Uh, you're filling up these panels. Those panels have to sit. Guys have to come down and wreck those panels. Those walls, you know, have to be inspected. There's a lot of rebar in between all those panels. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where if you're doing just a uh, block, you're just coming in masons. There's a little bit of rebar, but not as much, and you don't have to fill them with concrete. So they're just sitting blocks on blocks okay. on blocks, and then they stop at that foundation point, and then you can start framing once you've got your foundation okay. inspection and uh, and released. So how much sturdier would you say? So obviously the concrete is more expensive. Um, how much sturdier do you think that is for a foundation? Is it? Similar? Is it, you know, probably a little, like 20% stronger? Like, yeah. what is the specs on that? Great question. Now we're really digging into yeah. the weeds. But yeah. I'm, I'm honestly partially curious because eventually I think I may want to build. I don't, yeah. I don't know. but um. I'm, I'm going to throw out an analogy I've never used, but I'm thinking about it as we're talking. <laughs> you know, I like it. Fresh here on the Beyond yeah. Wealth podcast. A diamond's a diamond's <laughs> a diamond. It's yeah, got yeah. a different cut, quality, clarity. Yeah, but yeah. at the end of the day, it's a diamond. Okay. A foundation's a foundation's a foundation. How you choose to do it can be the best quality cut and clarity or maybe lower, but they're both a diamond. And, you know, we, we have codes that we have to build, standards we have to build yeah. to. So we wouldn't ever build a foundation that wouldn't withstand what it whatever yeah, current yeah, yeah. conditions come. Uh, but there is a better foundation, a better quality quality cut clarity right in the higher end and the poured walls would be that yeah yeah so would there be a construction project where you're like the load hitting this foundation is where we really need to be in the concrete realm basically like the load the load that hits it from a spec standpoint the concrete has to be the only solution for a when we're talking about residential only for a footing only for a footing. so any load can transfer to a block 
and to a footing. So yeah. you've got your typical perimeter foundation, which is sort of the box, the square. And then always in the center of a house, depending on how wide it is, you've got piers. So in the center of your house, we're pouring those footings, two typically two foot by two foot by two foot deep right. cubes. And then we're putting block if the load needs to transfer at that certain center section in your crawl space or your basement could be a pole, yeah, not yeah, a block, yeah. but we're, we're making sure that's done. And then we, if we're pouring walls, would just pour a single pier, solid concrete, instead of blocking it or yeah, instead yeah. of steel. Okay. Uh, so to answer your question, yeah, you can do any of them, and they're all of the same diamond, Right. but it's just... Cut Which quality one? and clarity no, that's, that's changing it. So that's how we value engineers. So another thing is when you go into the old bid-build process, you sort of say, I have this whole team, and they're helping me execute my house. Well, when you come into Riverbrook, Riverbrook will say, we've got our team in-house. They're yeah. employees. We're helping you design your budget. So a client comes in and says, I don't have $2 million. I have 700000 Can you build me a house? Well, sure yeah. we can. Yeah, so yeah. we're working backwards. We're not going to design your house. And then you and go then to the thing and say, this is a $1.5 million exactly. house. And it's like, well, we got, we're back to the drawing board. That's exactly. So Man, that's smart. You yeah, can yeah. build anything. You get over on some builders and they build 150 to 250 houses and they're track builders yeah, is what we yeah, call yeah. our industry. They've got guys that are coming there and plumbing for like $150, $250 a fixture. Right. There's a sink. Two hundred fifty dollars. There's a toilet. Two hundred fifty dollars. Our guys are around nine fifty to kind of set those same fixtures. It's different quality product. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can build super, super low, low end, and then you may get a recall on all your plumbing that came over from China, and you're going to come back and make up for building low, low end. Yeah. Or you can spend a little bit more money at the end of the day and have a better product. Um, both bring water to the table, yeah. uh, but one over time could come back. And, and you wish you would spend a little bit more, and then the other may not come back, and it services you for the next 10, 15 years. We call it legacy building. We're yeah. more of a legacy builder. Yeah, I love it. Okay, so before I see sticks going up, yep. you know, the, the, uh, the framing is what it, what it is. What is that timeline from, from house getting teared down to foundations ready for framing to go in? Okay. When someone visually is like, okay, there's progress, you know, like to the layman up until that point, they're like, there's no house, you know. Um, what is that timeline? What does it range from one to three months, you know, yeah. two years? Like, what are we Great looking question. at? Great you question. Know? So I just posted a story on our Instagram. We're big Instagram guys uh, at Riverbrook is, is who we are. On that story, we demoed in December on December 12th. Okay. And today, houses is, is fully complete on the exterior, landscape is in, and we're sanding hardwood floors uh, in seven months, eight months, and almost 20 days. We've got the entire structure complete, cabinets okay. in, yeah. and sanding floors, air conditioners on. So we can do a new build if it's coming in through Riverbrook because we're controlling all the design, right? Right, if, right, right. If we hear back from our tile vendors, hey, this tile doesn't exist, well, we're reaching out to the next tile guys that meet You're that same design it. intent yeah. and getting after it. We're in some of the bid-build process, which we have RFIs, requests for information, and some of the bid-build process, you shoot it out. Well, these guys are the best in the business that we work with as far as architects doing bid-build. They're as good as we are. We just design build in-house. Right. Right. They are working for a dozen other guys. Yeah, so yeah. the RFI may take a couple weeks mm -hmm. to get a response on that request for information. Hey, this tile isn't available. They only had you know, a lot of 100, and we needed 120. We can't finish the project. Well, by the time they get back with us with information, that project has sat. Now, we may have other things we're working on, but right. we're not working on tile. We're in-house for us. We're making a decision in real time because we meet every morning. We maintain our daily stand-ups. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wesley's now standing up. Yeah, I was going to ask. Is yeah, six year, he's six now. So we're talking six <laughs> years later. Uh, so we were at our house for two years, so six plus eight. Yeah. When he interrupts us. the meeting, though, he's still just like, hey, can I get some goldfish? That's uh, it. That's it. He builds Legos. <laughs> we build houses. And he's a phenomenal builder. That's awesome. So, so you know, in that, to answer your question, you know, we can build a house. Uh, we're working working on a, about a 6,000 square foot house. Now we'll have done in 12 months. Wow. So it's it's it can be done in a year. That same house could take 24 months. Yeah. It just depends on the team that you've selected, yeah, which yeah. Are, they all are great. 
Uh, but when we manage it all in house, we feel it's a it's a faster process. I would agree, and you know, I would also say my understanding would be some other things that could be delayed are the client. Like if you have a ton of work order changes, like you know, they walk. We'll say you get the framing up, and you're like you know, have them walk it to feel the rooms. And they're like, oh, this room feels small. And it's like, well, we got to reframe it. Okay, we can make that change, but it's going to, A, cost you, and it's also going to push back timeline. You that's know? right. And you do that once, okay, fine. That's that's the customer service you probably bring. You do that 80 times, it's going to push back your project. That's There's right. just no way around it. Yeah, which is rare, but, you know, because you have your plans developed on the front end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody sees we do all modeling in 2D and 3D. Okay. So that at the end of the day, we don't come back and couldn't get a feel for yeah. what the space inside was. We even have now a product we use where you can get inside your model. Uh, when our clients come into our office and we sit down and go through our consultations, we let them get inside the model and yeah. they can actually see it in three dimension. They can walk and they can't touch, but they can walk and look. Are you, are you using like we're using the Oculus? Ar- yeah, yeah, Oculus. Yeah, which, yeah, is, yeah, yeah. which has been a game changer for our clients to help them see it. Yeah, hey. I was talking with the architect um, and they were they were starting to do that and it's and it's you know, I wouldn't say relatively new technology, but it's so cool. And, right. it, and like you said, it, it allows your clients to feel it, to see it and say, okay, this is what I expected. Right. That's huge. It's ha- cutting have edge. Have you noticed uh, those changes coming down because of that? Or is it just Not a lot. buy-in? Or? Not a lot. So, so the changes we would typically see uh, are we give a whole bunch of allowances on the front end where yeah. if a client later on wanted a higher end surface and we right. gave them a $30,000 allowance for surfaces and then they ended up choosing uh, Alabama white marble versus uh, you know a Carrera marble. Right. One's a little bit more expensive. So we would send a, a change order. We do a cost plus system. So for us, it's not as formal as a change order, so yeah, to speak. Yeah. It just says, hey, here's your quote. Here's three options in your budget. Here's a couple options out of your budget. What would you like to kind of execute your vision? Because yeah. because we're not, it's your home, right? We're not trying to come in and implement Riverbrook into your house. We're just guiding you through your yeah. vision that you've given us through Pinterest boards and magazine snips and clips. Yeah. Uh, and we're just giving you the vision that you've given us. Uh, that's what you're paying us to do to kind of say, hey, these are the multiple floor plans that we think right. your family would love based on you showing us the inspiration. Yeah, inspiration and also like how your family functions. That's and, exactly. And to a degree, I, w- I assume people are coming to you for the products you have put out before. That's right. So, you know, and I'm going to use an analogy. If you've built a mid-century home, then maybe it's a bad one. But I'm, I don't think you guys do a ton of mid-century styling stuff, correct? Yes or no? Or You know, when you get into design terms... Uh, yeah. I'm kind of out. Uh, <laughs> you know, I don't think we do a lot of mid-century. We're, yeah. we're big into cottages. Yeah, yeah. And, that and, kind and, of f- yeah. Lee, feel. Lee and our design team are, are have executed the cottage well. But yeah. I think we were capable of mid-century. We may be in the process, actually, in Mountain Brook of a mid-century um, that that's probably to be posted soon. Yeah, yeah. So, but for the most part, you're kind of known right now for cottages. For cottages. That's right. So when people come to you, they're going to be like, hey, this is kind of what we work together because this is what now what's cool is you guys are kind of expanding now you could maybe add that to the repertoire of like stuff you start promoting but I've heard a lot of times too in marketing it's like you don't have to be everybody's client right you just got to be the the the, or um sorry you they don't have to be your client like at the end of the day you can you can help a certain amount of people that fit with your your aesthetic, your style. That's right. And I, and I, you know, looking through y'all's website is beautiful work. Thank you. I mean, it's excellent. Um, and there is a continuity. Like I keep going back to what you guys have built. I think the partnership of you and your wife, the partnership of the the whole organization, all the pieces you see are in play to make that is like, if you want a home that feels like there's continuity, go to Riverbrook. Because you guys have created that all-in-one solution, um, which I think is phenomenal. Yeah, so. well, thank you. I think, too, another thing that leads to the design is our clients. 
So everything you see posted was a project that we designed. Yes, we managed, we built, uh, but it was the wishes of the client. So they're not they're not spec houses, uh, they're client houses, and I think they see our website and are bringing that. So maybe some of the other designs that are to come are clients that look at it, see a lot of cottages, but hasn't brought us that mid-century design yet yeah. until we can get kind of those up. But we're capable of, of anything. That's all. Think sky's the limit. Yeah, man. So what is for the future for you guys? I mean, you you obviously accomplished a ton. Um, things are rolling. You got 26 projects going on right now. But where do y'all, what's the vision for the future? Where are y'all going? Great question. Nowhere. <laughs> Nowhere anytime soon. We're, we're, we're building this company as, as a legacy. And, and you know, hoping and praying our kids. I've got, you know, older son, two younger daughters, hoping that superintendent and two young designers or two young superintendents, if they want to manage the job site, uh, you know, want to take over one day. I, I think our we're looking uh, beyond us as, as we're trying to build this brand to have the best quality construction and legacy homes uh, that there are. So I, I think we're in the long haul. Now for growth, uh, you know, every year we're doubling in revenue. Every year we have grown significantly. And, and uh, you know, we are probably about to launch uh, larger. So we got a showroom and we do interiors. We have uh, furnishings. And in that showroom, we are about to expand. We're about to kind of um, grow in like some more antiques. We do uh, annual shopping trips. We just got back from Europe where we went to uh, France and Italy. And we've got... Good eight, excuse to go to France come and Italy, on, right? business trip. <laughs> we've got We a may have gotten a bit of pasta on the way. Come on, we could have eaten at the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> you know, who knows? Uh, while we were there working. That's awesome. Uh, but we, we, we have over 300 different relationships in Paris that we work with. We go to every one of their shops while we're there. It's a two-week trip. We've got a container on the water right now, front to back, top to bottom, slam-packed full of everything from armoires to chess, lighting to 17th century tapestries. You know, when we tell you they're antiques, we typically look for 15th, 16th, 17th, uh, not as much more 18th, 19th century uh, antiques you could find a lot of in the States. We were, we're trying to bring over just really old, nice, Very curated, pieces. and do yeah. a mixture between, uh, you know, Lee and our design team have done a phenomenal job of doing a mixture between new furniture uh, with antiques and blending and reupholstering and just getting the right drapes and the floor treatments and wall treatments. And, uh, you know, that's sort of what makes a space. That's why we got clients all over the country. We just finished product in Ontario. We're in Virginia where we do full furnishings, doing a 10,000 square foot house down to the silverware in Nashville uh, that have nothing to do with construction, but more interiors growing that yeah. brand. So that's sort of what's to come next, just growing that interiors arm. Uh, but our flagship is really design and construction, just bu building homes and building legacy homes for our clients. Man, I love it. I love it. You know, I love, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I, I learned a ton, you know, through the process. Thanks. And and every time I sit down with a business owner like yourself, who who is, you know, a couple steps in the journey further than I am, like, personally, I just want to thank you because it inspires me, you know, like, you know, there's parts of the journey where we're kind of like, you know, you're kind of in the trudge, like the day to day. Yeah. yeah. And okay. then you're like, you're like, you, you get up for a breath of fresh air and you're like, okay, it's going somewhere. And, and to see someone like yourself who is a couple steps ahead of where, where, you know, I am as far as, you know, different, different veins of where we're running, but like business wise, a little bit more developed. It's just really inspiring to see. Um, people doing great business here in Birmingham. Well, thank you. So. And, and everybody can get there. I, I just read a book. It was called uh, um, The Ride of a Lifetime by Bob Iger, Robert. He managed, I think, Disney for a long period of time and was well-known for it. He's the guy that kind of brought in Pixar and worked out the deal with Steve Jobs. And yeah. you know, he, he did some okay. stuff with Lucas and brought in you know Marvel and all these things they own today. But one of his famous quotes was, evolve or die. You've got to constantly be thinking for the future. You can't do what you've always done or you're going to get what you've always got. Yeah. You know, so for growth, you've got to bring in new technology like the Oculus. We have a cutting edge software that is an app that shoots our clients pictures daily. We do daily progress photos. Which I'm sure they photos. love. Love it. Love Man, it. Man, <laughs> they, can, they can be in Cosmel or they can be, you know, at a local accounting firm and yeah, they get yeah. a text 
and they got options to take themselves out, obviously, but they get text daily of us being on the job site, what's happening, so that they can keep up with their project too. Uh, so it's, it's just important to constantly be thinking, what do my clients need? What would I need if I was a client, regardless of what field you're in? Uh, one of my favorite podcasts is Contagious, and what Contagious tells you is this. Uh, I listened to it several hours there was a guy that basically created a Philly cheese. I mean, hey, if you've had one Philly cheese, you've had them all. You know, <laughs> you've had a donut, you've had them all. You know, there's a little variation. Um, but he created the Philly cheese that was about $140. And he was right next to a Philly cheese that was $5. But he had a line out the door for his $140 Philly cheesesteak when all they could have done was walk next door for the $5 Philly cheesesteak. Why? It was the hype and the excitement. It was how he's cultivated a flavor like no other. It wasn't just any Philly cheesesteak. And evolved. it became contagious. So that's no matter what yeah. business you're in, if you're if you're a painter or if you own a car dealership, you got to create an environment that's contagious. You got to help people see that you offer a product that everyone may offer, but yours is different. What is that? And how do I know the difference? I think those are several things. Just constantly evolve and then constantly create something, regardless if it's been created a you know, hundred times. You know, so everybody says don't recreate the wheel. There are ways to recreate the wheel. Watch Shark Tank. Yeah. You know, they're always the same product with a different idea. You yeah. got to get outside the box and it's 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 possible. All yeah. things are possible. One last question. I love this to just just wrap up. What's what do you love about Birmingham? You know, Birmingham has so many unique features, so many great industries, so many great things, but what do you what do you love about this this town and why why it's home for you guys? It's uh it's 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 a smaller town in comparison to you know big city Nashville or Atlanta uh, maybe even Memphis and uh, just just the the restaurants and the shops and the proximity to traveling you know we can we got we got a place on on Smith Lake it's like an hour front door to front door man lost have a place on Lake Martin it's an hour and a half front door to front door. We are every weekend or every other weekend, we're, we're on some body of water, super close. The beach is four hours away. Yeah. And we, my parents have a couple beach houses down there. If we want to run down and hang out and it's just, it's local, it's close. It's a small town feel. Everybody knows everybody. Yeah. I, no matter how big a city is, it turns out to be so small because it's that whole Kevin Bacon, seven degrees of separation. <laughs> yeah. In this town, it's like one or two yeah, 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 yeah. You no, know somebody. True. You and I met. We knew, you know, a hundred people right off. We yeah, knew yeah. a couple guys we we threw out. Uh, so I think it's just that small town feel. I grew up in a super small town, Clay, Alabama, next to Trustful, and everybody knew everybody. You know, it's the same way when you kind of move into Birmingham. As your footprint expands, you just meet and greet, and uh, everybody is is you know super nice and. I think that's what makes it such a small town. You get to larger towns is hustle and bustle. They're on the go. They may not have time for relationships and small groups. And I think Birmingham maintains that great feel. Yeah, I agree. It it is a great place to live, a great place to raise your kids and, and it's kind of that, you know, even we we live in Homewood and it's kind of a small town in a in a big city. But that's even right. even Birmingham itself is kind of a small town in a big country. You that's know, like, exactly right. You know, it does have a great feel and, and and when you said that it kind of goes back to, you know, I always talk with clients when they're because I have some clients that do some flipping remote. Um, I have some, you know, clients who do investing here, you know, but they don't live here. And I'm like, your name is still like your name will, if you do quality work or bad work, it'll get around. That's right. Um, you know, because it is a tight knit community. You know, it's it's a handful of investors, it's a handful of builders, it's a handful of um, you know workers that do these products, and um, and you have to bring you know your name. I heard it once. Your name is like the most valuable thing, and you got to bring that excellence to the table. That's so. right. Love it, man. Well, thank you so much for your time. I learned some. I honestly feel like we could have been here for three hours, four yeah, hours. Yeah, no doubt. Um, you know, and so I appreciate, you know, uh, you coming on and learning to ton through the process. If people want to get a hold of you um, and start a new build, uh, look at maybe getting some, some renovations, maybe buy some furniture, how do they, how do they reach out? Uh, through our website, uh, www.riverbrook.com. My, my email, kevin at riverbrook.com. My cell phone number's on all of our signs. So you can call my cell phone. That's awesome. Uh, so in any way, uh, any of those two or three would we'll be fine. And I got to figure out a way to get that hack. Oh, I can get you fire, one of these. Man. Hey, thank you. <laughs> Appreciate you. That's awesome, man. Well, thanks for the time. This was great. Thank you. All right.